In this part of the beginner's guide, we're going to get into dynamics. So we're going to start with the slightly older but still useful bullet tags for rigid body simulation. And then we're going to dive into the newer unified dynamics engine that we use for cloth, that you use for soft bodies, as well as ropes and balloons. So let's go ahead and get started. So here is the finished version of what I'm going to be going over today. We're going to be talking about rigid body simulation, the basics of those in a couple of different examples. We're going to be talking about cloth, how we can use that along with forces, since those can be used in simulations. You will also see soft bodies and end with taking a look at ropes and wire. So let's go ahead and get started here. Now in Cinema 4D, there's two different um, simulation engines here. The older bullet tags, uh, which we still have to use for rigid body simulation, though there are ways around that. Um, and the newer unified simulation engine where we can do things like cloth, ropes, balloons, um, and pyro. They all work together. So there is a way to kind of bridge the gap here and just use the um, newer version. But, um, you know, for more complex rigid body simulations, this is still uh, my preferred method. Now, all I have here is a cube in a Voronoi fracture object. And to do this, what we're going to do is right click on our Voronoi fracture object, go to bullet tags and choose rigid body, which I know is a little bit cut off. I do apologize. Now, what that's going to do is tell Cinema 4D we want this object to interact with other um, objects or pieces of geometry in our scene that we have assigned to be a part of this simulation using our um, rigid body tag here or our collider body, soft body, or even the ghost body tag from the bullet tag section. Now, if I just hit play, you'll notice this falls through um, our disc because um, our Voronoi fracture now has gravity applied to it or any other forces we create, um, but it doesn't have anything to interact with. And so if you want a piece of geometry to interact with um, something you've assigned the rigid body tag to, then the collider body is going to allow it interact without having any forces applied to it. So if I choose the collider body, now we see how we can get something to kind of crack or break apart. Going into the rigid body tag itself here, um, you can see whether or not it's enabled. Okay, that's actually a big part of what um, changes something from uh, it's the only difference really between the rigid body tag and the collider body is that dynamics and forces are enabled. Um, you can trigger this in a few different ways on a collision, for instance. That's very helpful if you're using the ghost body tag. And you can transition from it being dynamic to not dynamic um, on specific frames. You also have the ability to apply this tag to children. So if you apply this to, say, a cloner, um, you may want to uh, change the the settings on this though, they did change these a while back. And for the most part, if you're applying it to a Voronoi fracture or a cloner, this should work just fine. Um, the shape that's actually being used for the simulation is being determined here. And so for instance, if you're trying to, um, you know, have something fall inside a can or a cylinder or, or a bowl, for instance, you may need to switch the shape type to something like um, static mesh or even moving mesh. Right. We also have basic properties like bounce or friction. You can see if I turn up bounce, things are going to bounce around, have a little bit more movement as they interact with each other and the ground. Okay, Collision noise can give you a little bit more randomness in your simulations. Um, so if you want things to kind of move around a little bit more, be a little bit more unique, especially if you had the same object doing the exact same thing, collision noise can help there. We also have mass. Um, I've not had a whole lot of luck with mass getting it to kind of look believable, but in theory, you could come in here, set a different density or mass for objects. And that way, you know, a box full of pillows is going to act differently than say a box full of bricks. Um, the next section force, um, we're going to talk about follow position, um, in the next example, but I do want to switch to the cash section. Um, now with all of our different simulations, um, whether it's this bullet tag section or, um, a different one in the simulation tag, say rope, cloth, soft bodies, you will want to bake out the simulation before rendering this, especially on a render farm. And all that's going to do is calculate the simulation and save it into your file. So that way, when a computer goes to render it, it just reads the stored animation information. 
Um, this can also help speed up playback as well. Do keep in mind, if you do change any settings in here, you will need to clear all cache in order to uh, have them play back correctly and eventually bake it again when you are done. Moving on to our second example with the um, bullet tags here. All I have is a cloner, right, with just a sphere in it. And I've used a random effector to change uh, the scale of these objects. And so if you've ever seen a bunch of spheres just kind of um, poof out, I guess is the best way I can explain it. Uh, it's using dynamics here. So what we can do is add our rigid body tag ag again. However, if we play this, they're just going to explode. And this is something that you'll see a lot when objects intersect at the beginning of a simulation. Okay. Now, one of the ways you can fix this um, is by coming, well, you really don't want to fix it this way, but if you want your objects to follow existing animation um, or to stay uh, closer to their original position, that's where the follow position property comes in. So as I turn this up, you will see that these objects, when they simulate, um, they're not falling. They're ignoring gravity more and ignoring the position and other animations um, that you could have added um, before dynamic. So um, this is a great way to combine dynamics with um, other animation types. And the same type of thing happens for rotation. If you had an animated rotation on an object and you wanted it to use that more, as opposed to the rotation from the simulation, you can use um, this and increase it much the same way. Linear dampening um, will get rid of help get rid of any kind of weird little ambient movement you maybe would want to get rid of if something was like falling. Um, oftentimes with simulations, what you'll find is objects will kind of shake or vibrate a little bit even after falling. Um, and it, working with the linear dampening and angular dampening can help um, get rid of it. Okay, and that's pretty much it for uh, when it comes to working with bullet tags. I do have other videos that dive into these features in a lot more depth. So you can definitely check those out. But I want to move on to cloth. Now cloth, um, we can use on a primitive object, which is great because if we need to change the number of segments, we absolutely can. And you'll notice that with my cloth um, plane here, or what will be cloth, I've added quite a few segments already. What I'm going to do is right click. This time I'm going down to simulation tags and choosing cloth. All right now, um, the cube already had the collider body tag to it, but it's essentially the same process as before, right? Where um, if you want an object to interact with a simulation, you need it to have a collider tag in order to do that. So that's going to give us our basic cloth. Now, in the cloth itself, um, you'll want to focus on the surface section where you have properties like bendiness, stretchiness, same thing with friction as well as thickness. And once again, I have videos that dive into those features uh, more deeply um, it, and compare them if that's something you're interested in. However, for this, what I wanted to go over is kind of how to finish this, make it look a little bit better. You'll notice that the corners are poking through here and there's a couple of different ways you could uh, fix that. Um, the first would be to use a cloth surface. I think that's still under, yep, our generators here. And this is really two things in one. It's the ability to give uh, this thickness. So I can give this thickness here. And that might be a way to kind of hide those corners. And I can also add subdivision surfaces to smooth this out. But you'll notice we do get some, some weirdness there. So um, we do want to, you know, keep an eye on that. Right. Another way you can help um, fix this is by increasing the thickness of um, our cloth. Right. So if I increase this to say two, you can see it's starting to get a little bit better. Um, perhaps even three um, will be better. And you'll see there, you know, it's starting to almost resemble what we had before. And even now you can see it's poking through a single polygon and that's why you need a lot of detail in order to get, um, to get rid of that. So I maybe would also need to come in here and increase the number of segments, say 150 by 150. I doubt that's going to be enough to fix this completely, but 
it's going to get this much closer. And when you combine that with, say, a subdivision surface, um, then you can get some really, really nice detail, uh, even though you still may have a little bit of that corner um, poking through. Honestly, what I would do in a situation um, like this, depending on exactly what this is going to do, if it was just going to stay stationary like this, this is a little bit trickier. Um, but, it, but what I would do is cache this, which once again, we have our cache um, tab here, and it's very, very similar. Just ca hit calculate cache, and it'll go through and calculate it for us. But depending on how much of this box we actually see, we could actually just hide it, get rid of it, or even just move it down a little bit so the corner isn't poking through. So we can see that, you know, something like right here. I can just come in, move it down ever so much. And if we needed to still see it at some point, that could work. We could also just maybe scale it down a little bit as well. So it's no longer sticking out. Um, but that is how I would get rid of those types of issues with our cloth. Okay. Another important kind of thing you can do with simulations is rather than have it start from the very beginning where, you know, the cloth is just falling down, um, you can choose where you want this cloth to start from. So if I want it to already start draped over our cube here, what I can do is go into dresser. And this is where you do have to have an editable object. All right. So I made it editable and unfortunately I'll have to re-simulate it. But now what I can do is come in here and in my cloth tag, I can choose an initial state. So now when I hit set, that is exactly where my cloth starts from. And so I can start my simulation at a much better point in time as opposed to when it was being draped there, okay? And at any point, if you don't like that, you can clear it and it will go back to the beginning. And, and you have that in the bullet tags as well. Now, what you can also do is fix points. And this is useful for doing, say, a flag. Um, I'm not sure exactly how this is going to work with so many polygons, but we'll see. So if I select, say, the four corners, I can just do um, set. And now when I simulate this, those points will not move. So if you want to create a flag, this is the way to do it. Now you have to be careful because those points won't move. And so if you decide to move that flag, um, you could potentially run into issues. I'm not even sure it will let you. Even the subdivision surface, I don't think. Oh. Cool, so that will move, um, but the points for the plane themselves will not. So just be very careful with that. Now for, say, curtains, um, you would use the cloth belt. And while I'm not gonna talk about the cloth belt specifically in cloth, it's pretty much the same process as the rope belt in rope. So we will see how to do that. Now, what else we can do with cloth in all of these different simulations is use different forces, tractor, detractor, you guys can read, so I'm not going to go through each one. Let's say I want to create a wind. Okay, I can just kind of position it. Now, I can hit play. And what we'll see, and it may not be obvious initially, um, is that it's going to apply to pretty much everything we have simulated here. Okay, so it's not necessarily based on how close something is. Now, you can use a field to control you know, what things it gets applied to, because if you create a field, say a box field, that wind will only be ap applied if it's inside uh, a simulation or geometries inside that, that box. But just to show you, I could very easily increase my wind strength here to 20. I'm not sure that's going to be quite enough. You can see the cubes here moving. Um, they're getting blown away. So that's kind of a bit unrealistic considering our cloth isn't really doing a whole lot here. Um, and that's where, you know, maybe, yeah, you would want a field. You would want to scale it up so that our cloth is inside of it. And if I need to go into a side view to position this a little bit better, I absolutely could. And that looks pretty good there. This way right here. That's pretty big, but I think we'll be okay. And just so we can see this on the cloth, Let's really increase the strength here. Okay, still not seeing it a whole lot, so let's get crazier. Make it 2,000. There we go. So 
that's probably a bit too strong, but hopefully you get the idea. Okay, that all these forces work and regardless of which simulation engine you're using, and they can be used to make some more realistic interactions with things. So moving on, and I'm actually going to just turn off, well, maybe even just delete these to help speed things up a little bit. Okay, we have our soft body. Now, um, this uses the same types of tags we were using previously for cloth. In fact, the only difference is, I'll show you, uh, if I can find it, there we go, that soft body has been turned on. Um, and just like we've seen with our other simulations, we do need to have something to collide with. So I will create that collider. All right. And what you're seeing is, well, at least it appears to be a soft body, but it really isn't. If you uncheck soft body, you will see that we pretty much get the same thing. In fact, we get something better. So the way the soft body works is you really need to use, say, a vertex map um, to determine where it's going to be soft, where it's going to be not soft. You can also um, increase the number of um, poles it's using, and that's going to help um, determine how rigid this is as well. You can see as I go higher here, um, the less um, soft this is. So typically speaking, the few times I've needed to use soft bodies, I actually don't do a whole lot here. I really just use the cloth in conjunction with the balloon properties to get something um, that works just for me. And it's pretty easy to set up. Now the balloon property, um, I'm not going to go too much in. I actually did a video on this just recently as well, because the, the map section here is new and get some really interesting um, effects with it. But yes, this is typically how I use soft bodies, honestly, not even soft body itself, um, unless I'm going to dive in and use some vertex maps. Uh, and so if you've seen some animations like this, you know, the ones I've seen recently have been kind of making soft te Tetris blocks fit together. Um, this would be a good way to kind of get started with that process. All right. So that just leaves us with ropes and ropes really not all that different. Let's start with our disc here and apply our collider body to it. Don't think we'll need it, but just to be safe. And to create a rope, we need a spline. So I'll go into my front view here, my pen tool, and I'm just gonna click three points. All right, I'm gonna select my middle point, right click and make it soft interpolation just to give me something that looks pretty good. And you'll notice I've, Two poles here and as I said we're going to use kind of the uh, the rope belt object to make this work but uh, it's the same for the cloth belt okay on our spline I'm going to right click go to simulation tags and choose rope and so now if I just hit pay, play you're going to see our spline just kind of falls on the ground All right just laying flat great so what we can do is come over here to our simulation tags and choose rope belt. In fact, I'll duplicate this so we have two of them. And what you're going to do here is go into point mode. I'm actually going to go into um, wireframe mode as well because I need to select a point that I'm going to need um, to essentially connect to an object. And that's going to be this left Cube. And so what I'm going to do is drag that left cube into the object section here, hit set. And if you see a connection between the middle of your object, where the object axis is and that point, you know, you've done that correctly. And you would do the same thing for the second one, right? Because if I just hit play right now, and I have to go to object mode for this, or model mode, I should say, it's just going to kind of swing from that one point and hit the ground. Okay, so that's pretty good. I'm gonna do the same thing, right object goes in there this time and in point mode, select that right point, hit set, you can see that line there. And so now you can go through, hit play, and there's our rope. Now kind of the, the properties of the rope are pretty much the same as what we've seen previously where you have bendiness, bounciness, friction, all of those. So that's why I'm not spending too much time there. Radius also important, similar to the thickness of our cloth. But if you want to get something um, 
a little bit smoother, what you need to do is work with the intermediate point type. And if you want to see that, well, why don't we create some geometry with this? So I'm going to put this in a sweep. I'm going to put a, a circle in the sweep to create our actual shape here. And now you'll actually see the lines we have. All right, we have quite a few going around, but not so many, you know, lengthwise on this. And that's due to our intermediate point type. I do think natural or uniform works best. You can see just by doing that, we get something that has a little bit more movement to it. And as I increase this, we're going to get something that has a little bit more flex, has a little bit more give, and has some more definition and detail to it. So that's how we can work with um, our rope. Now, the last thing I want to talk about really quickly is some of our project settings when it comes to simulation. Uh, now, we do have some overall quality settings in the substeps and iterations. Okay, dampening can also be useful. And in the scene section, you can also decide between how much gravity you want and the time scale. So if you want to do some slow motion stuff, you can do that in here. Um, the device that it defaults to is the graphics card. So keep that in mind. Um, I've not had any problems with this um, with the, the newer system. Um, but if you do have a weaker GPU, it may be worth experimenting to see if the CPU version um, will work any better. That will do it for this video. If there's anything else you would like to see, please let me know. And until next time, take care.